The papers have begun piling up on the already occupied desk. Seth pushes an empty coffee cup aside to make more room for two more folders and a roll of red string. A cardboard hangs on the wall, covered in pictures, newspaper articles, and various notes all connected by said string. The mere sight of it increases Seth's stress level enough for him to feel them bubbling up inside of him. He's tempted to throw the cup at it and watch it break into pieces, like his case. His secretary clears her throat. <clears> she stands beneath the doorframe. The rays of light from the afternoon sun that wash over her cast hard shadows on her angular face. They reflect eerily on her round glasses. Are you done? No, Tatiana. Too bad. She walks in and grabs the cup, probably to refill it. Go home already, Seth. We don't even know if this is your guy. <clears throat> The man grunts. It can't be anyone else. The victim matches with the others he's killed. The pictures on the left side of the board showcase young, fair-skinned women in their 20s. Their dead, empty eyes look somewhere away from the camera. All of them lack eyelids and present scars around her eyes. The location is farther than usual, but the bird killer was getting bold. Finding new hunting grounds is something he'd eventually have to do. Tatiana adjusts her glasses. It could be a copycat. Seth cringes the moment he hears those words. Most of his co-workers know better than to suggest such a thing to him in the midst of the investigation. Not only were lives on the line, Seth's pride has also taken a hit. And his stubbornness won't allow him to consider any other theory, unless reality itself contradicts him. Tatiana doubles down. The methods, killing rituals, I mean, don't match that much besides the eyelids being ripped from the girls' faces. His secretary refuses to hold her punches or to coddle her boss. It's the main reason she still works there. Others include how good her coffee is. Seth lets his hip press into the edge of the desk, supporting himself on it. He picks up a sheet of paper absentmindedly. News outlets have squeezed this case as much as they can. People are angry at us because this guy's still at large. If it were a copycat, don't you think they'd try harder to pass as the bird killer? Tatiana hums appreciatively. Hmm. Maybe, she shrugs. The only thing I can be sure of is that you not getting enough sleep won't make this case go any faster. They glance at each other a moment too long. To Seth's pleasure, it's Tatiana who breaks the exchange by turning around and leaving him. He sees her put away the cup, grab her coat, and exit the office after a meek wave goodbye in his direction. He remains in place until her footsteps completely vanish at the end of the hallway outside. He leaves too, but his route leads him somewhere else other than home. The morgue two floors down is cold as it should be when he goes in. The door had been locked, but Seth has owned an unregistered copy of its key for a couple of weeks. A camera hanging alone in a far corner of the wide room emits a dull, buzzing sound. The device is old, barely serviceable, and mostly left alone on the other side of the connection. Seth is alone with the body, resting on the metal table in the middle of the room. Rows of cold storage lockers line up the wall to his right, while computers, a sink, and chemicals fill the space to the left. There's a sheet covering the body. Seth pulls it off. The woman beneath has seen better days, Seth thinks. Anyone with eyelids and their organs still in their body has surely seen better days than Whitaker, Carla, white, 23 years old. Miss Whitaker had been a barista in a coffee store three streets away from Bird Avenue, where most of the killings had taken place. Her midsection is completely cut open, and her liver is missing. At first glance, the work done to her is messy. To Seth, it's too messy. Deliberately messy. The blood stains at the edge of the open wounds are brownish. The liquid has mostly oxidized from being exposed. 
The cavern that is her abdomen is covered in a sheer layer of pus and more blood. Bone protrudes through what is left of her intestines. Her useless appendix is there, though, humorously left behind. The bird killer is, or used to be, more elegant. Subtle, even. His incisions were calculated, the aftermath clean. The cleanup crew had sheepishly exposed to Seth days ago that they sort of missed that, when comparing it to the terror that was the scene in which Miss Whitaker has been found. Unflinching, Seth looks directly into the woman's eternal stare. Why did you change? Why now? He's not asking her. Part of him doesn't know who he's asking, actually, as the evidence against the fact that this killer is the same serial monster he's been trailing for years continues to rain down on him. Seth scratches a stubble at the base of his chin and tries to say a prayer for her. Catholic school has failed him, for he remembers none. He peruses the notes that the forensic pathologist made earlier. There's nothing new on them, besides the results from the lab. Miss Whitaker had been drugged hours before her death. Whether it was by her own volition, as the drug is nothing more than a small dose of marijuana, or forced down her throat by her assailant, is unknown. Previous victims' lab results denied the presence of drugs in their systems at the time of their murders. They struggled uselessly against the bird killer. This one didn't. Are you growing tired? Careless? Seth lets out, the words escaping through his lips. Are you taunting me? His phone starts ringing. Seth Anderson speaking, he says into it, angling the phone between his neck and his shoulder while he reads. The voice of another detective, Hughes, buzzes against his ear, drenched in anxiousness. We've... we've found another body. He runs. On his drive to the address that Hughes gives him, Seth notices that he's getting further and further away from Bird Avenue. His hands tighten around the steering wheel, and his knuckles remain white even when walking into the crime scene. He almost tears the yellow tape around the scene's perimeter. The whole team, including the paramedics, examine the interior of a warehouse from top to bottom. Massacre can't even begin to describe what he finds. The place must have been designed to keep meats in the past. There are hooks hanging from the ceiling, swinging above pools of blood. They're wet with it, and their oscillations push even more of it out of the body parts that have been nailed on them. Once again, he's got a female victim. Most of her, at least. Divided and sectioned, her legs hang to the left, arms to the right. Her exposed torso also cut open and emptied hangs above Seth. A drop of thick blood falls on his face when he looks up. Seth doesn't clean it up. They never find the woman's head, and her fingertips have been burned. She remains nameless, with no family to present the body to. A series of numbers at the top of a police report. Sir? Seth wakes from his musings. A young officer hands him a piece of folded paper. It's dirty, and Seth grabs it with the tips of his fingers. What's this? The officer gulps and averts his eyes. See for yourself, sir. With a grim feeling settling itself on his shoulders... Seth unfolds the paper, and then he lets it fall to the ground into a pool of darkening blood, causing ripples to break on its surface. It's a picture of Seth himself, exiting his home with smiles scribbled all over it. It's not the only picture of him in the scene. Small white paper squares with images on them dot the scene, some hanging from the woman's extremities. Most of them are of the victim. There are two other photos of him in the office, another in the supermarket, and a fifth one taken during his morning run in the park. The room suddenly grows cold. There are dates on the back of the photos. They go back months. 
Seth's boss orders him to lay low for a while, even suggesting to consider moving into a new apartment when Seth refuses to go under witness protection. He also refuses protection of any sort watching over him. Days begin to pass Seth by, and nothing occurs. He's not allowed back into the office for weeks. His phone service has been canceled, with his job providing a new disposable one for the time being. It's Tatiana herself who dares to visit him every other day. They've got me working under Hughes. She complains over a cup of tea she boiled without permission in Seth's apartment. They're in his living room, sitting in the dim light that the drawn curtains let through. Any news? The woman shakes her head. He curses under his breath. At least no new victims. That we know of, Tatiana adds. We found the last woman by mere casualty. If those teenagers hadn't tried to sneak in for a smoke, she would have decomposed there. Seth's knee begins bouncing. No. Those kids said a man pointed them in the direction of the warehouse. That scene was set up for me to see. Damn it. They just had to be so drunk and careless already to not remember the man's face. That was the bird killer. He lets his face fall into his hands. He was there. We spoke with living and breathing people that have interacted with him. And we're still on square one. Tatiana stands. I'll come back when you're in a better mood. She doesn't wash the teacup on her way out. Much time later, the young secretary would come to regret the fact that those were the last words she ever said to Seth. It doesn't surprise her immediately that Seth begins ignoring her calls, nor does she call much while the investigation is ongoing. It's terrifying to know that Seth had been watching the killer as much as the killer had been watching him. And the doubts about him being the same man committing all those murders finally vanish. Back in the office, during a particularly hot day, she notices that officers and detectives are eyeing her weirdly. Before she can ask Hughes about it, the man speaks. I'm so sorry, Tatiana. We were too late. A drop of sweat runs down her forehead. Too late for what? The emptiness of Seth's office looms in her mind. The woman takes a peek into it past Hughes's shoulder, and she focuses on the board with the pictures and the red thread. She doesn't want Hughes to reply, but he does anyway. The boss sent an operative to receive Seth this morning. It's been days since we last made contact with him. A pause. There's... he's... He's gone, Tatiana. His apartment's empty. Nothing out of place, but the neighbor said it's been days since the last time anyone saw him. A second pause, this time to allow Tatiana the opportunity to react. The woman feels her face remain impassive. She tries to force any sort of emotion on it, but she can't quite choose one. Her lower lip trembles. Could it have been him? She dares not say the title. Hughes cringes, then gulps. The team found tissue on the scene. Tissue? Eyelids, Tatiana. Seth's eyelids. For the first time in Tatiana's career, she wishes she could hear Seth saying, I told you so, one last time. There's only silence. Subscribe today or beware.